Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're very excited that we are able to um, support Inflection and in sharing the data from their phase two clinical study for their topical gel that treats cutaneous neurofibromas. Um, we have a lot of attendees who are coming in, so we are going to wait just a second before we get started to make sure everyone has a chance to get into the room. All right, so in the interest of time, we are going to go ahead and get started, although I do still see people joining, so um, welcome as you all come in. Um, we are so grateful at the Children's Tumor Foundation to be able to host this webinar for Inflection to share their data from their phase two clinical trial on the topical gel um, being used to treat cutaneous neurofibromas. Um, we are lucky enough to have with us tonight three of the members of the Inflection team. We have um, William Holder, who is their holder, who is their CEO. We also have Gerd, who is their COO, and presenting the information tonight, we're fortunate to have um, Dr. Sarin. So at this point, um, I will remind everybody that as this is a webinar, you won't be able to unmute yourself and talk. But there is, if you look at the, the toolbar, which for me is on the bottom of my screen, there is a little Q&A feature, and you can use that to ask questions throughout the webinar. Some we may answer um, in the chat, and some we may wait and um, do at the end and do a more conversational and, and let Dr. Sarin really speak to those points. Um, but you can enter those questions at any time during the course of the presentation. So um, we have also had several questions about whether or not a recording will be available. We are hopeful that we will have a recording of this session to be available, but it will take, a, uh, take us a few weeks to get that edited and posted. But I will send out a notification to everyone who registered for this webinar when that becomes available. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Sarin. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kavita Sarin. I'm an associate professor of dermatology at Stanford University, and I also direct the skin cancer genetics program. And um, on behalf of Inflections, I'm excited to share with you the uh, results of the phase 2B study of NFX-179 topical gel for the treatment of cutaneous neurofibromas. Uh, but first, just some disclaimers. Uh, we may talk about plans um, or, uh, or, or goals moving forward, and these are all not set in stone. They can change at any time. Um, also, I wanted to remind everyone that NFX-179 is an investigational drug, and it has not been reviewed or approved um, by the FDA or any other regulatory agency. My disclosures, um, I've had the pleasure uh, for the last almost decade to serve on the Scientific Advisory Board for Inflection Therapeutics and have had some sponsored research from um, Inflection Therapeutics. I also co-lead uh, the RAINS Cutaneous Neurofibroma Working Group with Ashley Cannon. Um, I've uh, received research grant funding from the Neurofibromatosis uh, Therapeutic Acceleration Program. Um, 
And I also serve as a consultant to some other companies which are unrelated to what I will be discussing today. Um, I'm joined uh, by Bill Hodder, president and CEO of Inflection Therapeutics, and uh, Garrett Karkendorfer, who is the chief operating officer of Inflection Therapeutics, who will be uh, join me in answering questions or um, through the chat or at the end of the presentation. But first, I'd like to start with a cathedral, and not just any cathedral, um, a modern day cathedral. So on Monday night, I flew back from Barcelona, and uh, I don't know if anyone here has had the opportunity to go to Barcelona, but it's just a gorgeous city. And right in the heart of Barcelona is this modern day cathedral, La Sagrada Familia. And one of the things that's just amazing about La, Gratis, uh, La Sagrada Familia is just the level of detail, attention that is put to every piece of work um, from the sculptures to the pillars through the structure. And it occurs to me, you know, you, you need an entire team to build um, a cathedral like this. And this uh, building a cathedral like this takes a lot of time. For example, La Sagrada Familia was designed in starting 1882. And when I was visiting in 2024, you can still see the construction towers here are still, still under construction over um, a century later. And the amount of engineers, um, so investors, supporters, um, architects, artists um, involved in just building a cathedral is just, it's mind boggling. And um, they're doing this knowing that this may not actually, this will not probably happen in many of their, their lives. They will not see the completion. Gaudi, who was one of the major architects of this cathedral died in 1927. So we'll never got to see the cathedral the way it is today. Um, but they do this for this greater good, right? For, for this, in this case, to give glory to God, right? They do something to, to, to better humanity, to, to, to give, give of themselves and of their passions uh, for a greater cause. And this reminded me a lot of medical science where we're building on the footsteps of others. We're working as a team with investors, supporters, advocacy, patients, um, clinicians, scientists to build something that we feel like is good for humanity. And for many of us on this call, we're all building something together to do something that we feel like can improve the health of, of individuals affected by neurofibromatosis type one. So that's, you know, just something that's been so impressive to me. And I think that, you know, something that I, I feel so proud of that, you know, we're doing this together and excited to share, you know, where we've come with inflection therapeutics in terms of sort of building this program to improve the lives of participants with NF1. And so I thought I would start with history before jumping into the phase 2B, because I think it's easy to fail to appreciate how much work goes into developing a drug. So this NFX-179, the idea for it came in 2013, almost a decade ago. Um, the founders of in, um, Inflection, uh, Mark D'Souza, Michael Wooten, Scott Plotkin, had the idea of developing a topical MEK inhibitor for the treatment of cutaneous neurofibromas. However, uh, it wasn't until 2015 when Venn Bio and F Prime partnered with Inflection to provide the funding to make this a reality. And from 2016 to 2018, this brilliant uh, chemist named John Kincaid designed over 100 compounds um, and synthesized these compounds and ran them, we ran them through a battery of tests to identify the best compound that would serve as a topical MEK inhibitor treatment for cutaneous neurofibromas. And these tests included safety tests, such as mutagenic assays. They included um, biomarker assays and cell lines, biochemical assays, um, all to des design to identify the best drug candidate to move forward. And from this assay came NFX-179. And NF NFX-179 was chosen um, because it was highly potent in blocking the pathway that causes cutaneous neurofibromas to grow in the skin. Um, but it was also rapidly metabolized when it hit systemic circulation so that it could limit systemic exposure to the drug. Unfortunately, NFX-179 is very difficult to dissolve or to, to, to formulate. And so um, from 2018 to 2019, Enflection um, launched a, a massive effort to formulate NFX-179 into a topical formulation that could be pleasing and applied to the skin. From 2018 to 2020, 
animal toxicology studies were run, and these were run in mini pigs, in dogs, in rats. And the goal is to ensure that this product was safe for human application. We were grateful to the Tumor Foundation, Children's Tumor Foundation um, to help provide additional support to actually launch NFX 179 into human ready clinical trials. And from 2020 and to, to 2021, uh, the phase 2A biomarker study was launched, which showed that NFX-179 could suppress the RASMAP kinase pathway in cutaneous neurofibromas. And this served as the basis for the phase 2B study, uh, which ran from 2020, 2021 to 2023, which I'll be sharing with you um, more about today. So just the amount of work that went into just where we are today has just been massive. And it's not any one person, any one company It's required investors and patient advocates, patient um, uh, clinical trial participants, clinical trial investigators, scientists, um, and just a whole operations team to actually get this drug to where it is today. So this is just an example of the cathedral building team. I think, you know, we are all, everyone who's supporting the development of drugs and therapeutics for NF1 is part of this team who's trying to build something greater than themselves. So I'd like to start with the acknowledgements. And um, I'd really like to start with a deep felt thank you um, for all of the participants who participated in the clinical trial, for all of the supporters who supported the recruitment or um, uh, advocacy for the clinical trial and the entire support of the NF1 community. We can't, I would love to list every participant of the clinical trial, but that would be illegal. Um, so we just want to say that we're just so grateful, um, even though you, we can't name you um, specifically on these slides. Also very thankful to the Children's Tumor Foundation for all of their support and advocacy. Um, the entire Inflection team, who has just been just a wonderful group of people who've just really helped bring this to reality. Um, the Phase 2A investigators who ran, who ran and enrolled participants in the biomarker study, the Phase 2B st study investigators for the clinical efficacy study, um, this really does take a village and um, we're really thankful for all of your support. So why, uh, why do we believe a MEK inhibitor can be helpful for the treatment of cutaneous neurofibromas? And this all comes down to the scientific pathway that drives MEK inhibitors. Here on the left is the diagram of the RAS MAP kinase pathway which is the main pathway which drives the growth of nerve cells and the growth of cutaneous neurofibromas. This RAS pathway is in every cell in our body, but normally it's actually held under control by a protein called neurofibromin, which is listed as NF1 here. NF1 inhibits the RAS pathway, thereby controlling the overgrowth of cells. Unfortunately, in cutaneous neurofibromas, NF1 is lost. This leads to uncontrolled activation of the RAS-MAP kinase pathway. This RAS activates RAF, which activates MEK, which activates ERK, all downstream in a cascade, which eventually leads to uncontrolled nerve cell growth. MEK inhibitors, like NFX-179, block the RAS-MAP kinase pathway by inhibiting MEK. So by stopping MEK here, it puts the brakes on the RAS-MAP kinase pathway, thereby uh, halting the pathway that drives nerve cell growth. And it's not just theoretical, this has actually been validated in other NF1-driven lesions. Um, for example, uh, cellumetinib, which is this MEK inhibitor, a systemic MEK inhibitor, has been shown to have clinical efficacy in inhibiting the growth of and shrinking plexiform neurofibromas in pediatric patients. And Kosalugo cellumetinib received FDA approval for this indication in 2020. So it does appear that MEK inhibitors can suppress the growth and shrink RAS-driven tumors. Unfortunately, oral MEK inhibitors have significant side effects. And this includes toxicity to the heart, toxicity to the eye, lung inflammation, kidney failure, diarrhea, and an acneiform rash. And these side effects can make it challenging to use for the long-term treatment of cutaneous neurofibromas. So inflection's goal is to develop a topical MEK inhibitor that can be applied to the skin and is potent in the skin, but is soft or made of metabolically labeled. So, so when it's absorbed into systemic circulation, 
It's rapidly metabolized to minimize systemic exposure and systemic side effects. So just a little bit more about inflection therapeutics. Inflection is developing the first in class topical treatment for neurofibromatosis type one. Um, as many of you know, neurofibromatosis is a rare genetic disease. It has a prevalence of about one in 3000 individuals, and it's caused by mutations in this NF1 gene, this break gene on the RAS pathway, which leads to the growth of cutaneous neurofibromas. The approach inflection is taking is to develop these soft MEK inhibitors to suppress the pathway in the cutaneous neurofibromas, but break down rapidly in systemic circulation to minimize systemic toxicity. And in NFX 179, the topical gel has been now through two phase two clinical studies. It completed phase two A study, which demonstrated that NFX 179 could suppress this pathway in the skin um, and in cutaneous neurofibromas. And then a phase two B study, which I'll be sharing with you the results of today, which showed that NFX 179 can have clinical efficacy in the treatment of cutaneous neurofibromas. So Inflection's hope is that NFX 179 could be the first approved therapeutic treatment for cutaneous neurofibromas. So let's talk about the phase 2B study. Um, this was a double-blind, vehicle-controlled, multi-center study. So what does that mean? Double blind means that neither the investigator nor the participant knew what they were putting on their skin, whether or not it was drug or vehicle. Vehicle controlled means that the participant enrolled in the trial could be putting drug on their skin, but they could also be putting on the exact same formulation without any drug, the vehicle. And multi-center means it was just conducted across 24 different sites in the United States. All participants, had a clinical diagnosis of, neuro, of neurofibromatosis type 1, and at enrollment, 10 target lesions were identified uh, for treatment. And the target lesions had a minimum size between 7 and 14 millimeters in length, 5 to 14 millimeters in width, and greater than 2 millimeters in height. And these target sizes for the cutaneous neurofibromas were chosen just to make sure that the uh, neurofibroma sizes were relatively uniform across the groups. The goal of the study was to have 100 evaluable subjects randomized one to one to one to a low dose, which is a 0.5% NFX 179 uh, topical gel, a high dose, which is 1.5% NFX 179 topical gel, or a vehicle only control. And this study was able to enroll 199 subjects during the course of the study. Each participant applied the drug once daily or the vehicle their, their agent once daily to each of their 10 target cutaneous neurofibromas for a total of six months. And there was a one month safety follow up at the end of the study. And the primary endpoint was the percent of subject responders defined as subjects with at least five out of their 10 cutaneous neurofibromas shrinking by 50% or more in volume. So I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. So, what does that mean? That means that. Um, if a participant had four tumors that shrank by 90% and six tumors that shrank by only 20%, they would be considered a non-responder because only four out of their 10 tumors shrunk by greater than 50%. But if they had another participant had six tumors that shrank by 80% and four tumors that shrunk, shrunk by 20%, they would be considered a responder because six, so more than five of their tumors shrank um, by 50% or more. Other things that were analyzed were the percent change in the cutaneous neurofibroma volume, the physician tumor assessment of change, the participant or the subject's self-assessment of change, and a patient-reported outcome of whether or not their tumors were better. So how was the tumor volume calculated? Well, each tumor was measured on three dimensions. They were measured on the length of the tumor, the width of the tumor, and the height of the tumor using a ruler. And then the volume of the tumor was modeled using an ellipsoid. And the volume of the cutaneous neurofibroma was half of the ellipsoid. So sort of this half of the shape here. And so here you can see an ultrasound image of the cutaneous neurofibroma um, with three measurements. So this is, you know, there's, there's the length, the width, and the height. and the 
volume of the cutaneous nerve fibroma was basically half of this ellipsoid shown here, it would be this uh, modeled for, for the volume. So this is the money slide. Um, it was a success. Um, the high dose NFX 179 gel met the primary endpoint, which meant there were a significantly increased percent of responders in the high dose group as compared to the vehicle control. So here's the data. 44.2% of participants in the high treated with high dose NFX 179 gel were subject responders as compared to 24% treated with the vehicle control. The low dose group actually had about right in the middle number of responders with 34.6% uh, of responders uh, in the low dose group. The next question was, well, what measurement contributes most to the shrinkage in volume? Is it the length, is it the width, or is it the height? And the analysis showed that it's actually the height that contributes most to the decrease in volume. So when height was used as the measurement outcome, so each responder was now had to have at least five out of their, five out of their 10 cutaneous nerve fibromas shrink at least 50% in height, um, the results were uh, even more statistically significant. In the high dose group, 39.5% participants were subject responders, whereas in the vehicle group, only 10% of the participants were subject responders. And again, this was dose dependent because the uh, subjects treated with the um, low dose of NFX 179 were right in the middle with 23.1% of responders. So this suggests that height was the greatest contributor uh, to the volume reduction that was seen in the study. But is that meaningful? I mean, is it important to flatten cutaneous neurofibromas? And we think the answer is yes. And this is data that came from um, the RAINS Cutaneous Neurofibroma Working Group's uh, adult survey, which was led by Ashley Cannon and published in Neurology in 2021. And participants were asked the question, if my raised cutaneous neurofibroma looked more flat, uh, I would be okay with my cutaneous neurofibromas. And 65% of participants agreed or strongly agreed with this statement. So we think that flattening a cutaneous neurofibroma could uh, ha be, be meaningful to participants. And it's not just this data. Um, we have asked that question in our, um, uh, in our studies in terms of asking participants you know, who had a height reduction whether or not that was meaningful. And they have also uh, described that predominantly as meaningful. So how much change occurred? Um, on the left here, this is the mean percent change in tumor, vo uh, tumor volume per subject. And on average, um, in the active uh, arms, the drug treated arms, the 0.5% um, and 1.5%, there was a significant uh, sh uh, shrinkage in tumor volume as compared to vehicle only. So in the high dose group, there was a 28.6% decrease in tumor volume as compared to the vehicle group, which had a 14.7% decrease. Um, when looking at heights and a flattening of the tumor, um, in the high dose group, there was a 25.3% reduction in height, um, an average height as compared to 10% in the vehicle group. And again, the low dose group was right in the center, center uh, right in the middle with an 18.4% reduction. Uh, photographs have a hard, uh, 2D photographs are really have trouble capturing height, but we decided to put in a couple to see if you can appreciate uh, the, the difference in height here. This is a participant who had a 90% volume reduction at six months. And this is the pre-treatment photograph of the cutaneous neurofibroma. And this is the um, post-treatment uh, photograph of the cutaneous neurofibroma. And it is difficult to appreciate height. It's kind of like looking down on a satellite ma map where it's very hard to see the flattening. Um, here's another photograph. Um, of, a, of a neurofibroma that shrunk by 75% at six months as compared to baseline. And again, you can see the neurofibroma circled here. And what's also interesting about this photo is that there's a cafe au lait, which is a uh, flat pigmented patch or um, lesion that occurs in um, NF1. And interestingly, uh, this it looks like this, this adjacent cafe au lait is also significantly lightened at six months compared to a baseline. 
Um, and as one of the participants in the trial said, um, they've definitely flattened out. Uh, they don't stick out as much. So I think that makes them less noticeable. But you know, most importantly, it's what uh, the patients think about <laughs> the, the results of their cutaneous nerve aroma. So at the end of the study, uh, participants were asked to score their overall change from baseline um, for each tumor. And so for each tumor, they rated uh, their improvement on a 10 point scale, no change, seven point scale, sorry, no change, a little worse, much worse, very much worse, a little better, much better, are very much better. And in the high dose group, 49% of participants said that 49% of tumors were rated as, uh, as better, a little better, much better, or very much better. Whereas in the vehicle group, only 22% of tumors were rated as better. And um, in the low dose group, it was in the middle of the two. And this was similarly, a uh, similar result was seen from when participants were asked to score the change in size from baseline. And at the end of the treatment, um, more uh, participants said that the change that they witnessed was meaningful in the active arms um, treated with drug as compared to vehicle. And this highly correlated with the tumor volume response that was seen um, uh, in their studies. So it appears that um, the high treatment arm leads to uh, increased uh, improvement, patient reported improvement in their change from baseline. What about adverse effects? Well, 153 participants completed the 26 week treatment period. For, there are 46 discontinuations before week 26. 29 discontinuations were just due to life events um, and were equally distributed across the arms but there were 17 discontinuations due to adverse events. And all 17 of these adverse events were cutaneous adverse events. There were 13 discontinuations in the high dose group for dermatitis, pruritus, erythema, pain, and rash, and um, four discontinuations in the low dose group for dermatitis and rash, and, and no discontinuation in the vehicle gel, gel group. And it's important to note that this trial had very strict criteria in that participants were not allowed to treat the rash. Um, so this was a good learning point because they weren't allowed to treat their itching or their corticosteroids with, uh, with or, or itching or dermatitis with corticosteroids. And that is something that has been planned for the phase three study is to allow the use of topical corticosteroids and dose holidays to help reduce the discontinuation rate. On the left, this is just some of the skin findings um, that were, uh, were reported and um, of note, uh, almost all of the skin findings were mild to moderate in nature. Uh, well, what about systemic exposure? So as I described earlier, um, NFX-179 was sort of created to be almost like Snapchat, you know, it does what it needs to do and then it disappears, right? And, and that's kind of the goal is, well, is it actually doing that? So this, uh, assay looked at the amount of NFX-179 in human plasma after topical administration. And the high dose, and the answer is there's very little in circulation. In the high dose group, which is uh, the 1.5% NFX-179, there was a mean of 0.58 uh, nanograms per milliliter seen in circulation. In the low, gross, uh, low dose group, it was 0.08, and then vehicle, of course, did not have any drug in circulation. And to put these numbers in perspective, this is um, three orders of magnitude lower than the drug exposure, systemic drug exposure with oral selumetinib at its approved dosing. And so that's that's a thousand fold, it's over a thousand fold lower um, than the oral systemic MEK inhibitors. And there were no uh, metabolites detected in human plasma. So it does appear to be working like Snapchat, um, where it disappearing, um, gets where it needs to go and then disappears. So in conclusion, uh, the primary endpoint of subject level responder analysis for tumor volume was met, meaning that there was a significant reduction uh, percent of uh, participants who were subject responders who had uh, a volume response um, 
in the high dose NFX179 group as compared to vehicle. The patient global impression of change, which is the patient reported outcomes, um, also uh, were meaningful and, in, and in, uh, showed improvement in the high dose group as compared to the vehicle and strongly correlated with volume and height reduction. It was overall generally well tolerated and there were no systemic safety signals um, and overall extremely low exposure in circulation. And so this safety and tolerability of these two studies, um, as well as the clinical efficacy provides a basis uh, for further development and progression into phase three. So what are the next steps? Um, well, in the first half of 2024, Inflection is meeting with US and EU regulators to design the study. The study is phase three study is currently being planned in North America, Europe, and Australia from 2024 to 2026. And the hope is that by 2026, there could be some submissions for regulatory approval of NFX 179. And with that, I'll stop there and we can take any questions. Thanks, uh, Kavita. We got lots of questions. My uh, Gurdon, my my fingers are cramped up. We've been uh, answering so many here. Um, so let me give you a couple of the the bigger questions that uh, a few people have asked. Um, let's see. So uh, one of them was uh, about the responder rates and why did did we expect to see such a high vehicle slash placebo response? And was that surprising to us? So I, I thought you could talk about that for a minute. Uh, what a fantastic question. So I'm going to go back to um, the responder rate, uh, which had a vehicle response of 24%. And while 24% vehicle response is in line with what we see in dermatology trials, it's actually, I personally was quite surprised given what we know about the natural history of cutaneous neurofibromas. They don't tend to spontaneously uh, shrink as far as I'm aware. Um, and so one way to interpret this is that the vehicle is just a very good vehicle. It's moisturizing to the skin. It plumps up the surrounding borders, which makes the edge of the tumor more difficult to discern. Um, and um, the support of this suggests, and the reason why, and maybe with the edge of the tumors, you know, more difficult to discern, the um, area measurements or the length and width measurements may come in a little bit smaller um, after treatment of vehicle. Um, and so that's one possibility. And in support of that, you can see on the right here that uh, when you look at height alone and you don't take into account length and width, um, the vehicle response drops to um, only 10%. But um, that's just one theory. But it was uh, surprising to see a response uh, in measurements just from treating with the vehicle alone. Yep. Great. Uh, another question that a number of people asked was, um, what is, did we study what happens when the gel is stopped? And of course, we haven't. But um, what did they think? Uh, sort of a general theme about what would happen once uh, people would stop the gel. Uh, would the tumors grow back? Uh, would they grow back bigger? How fast would it take? So lots of questions around that uh, area. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, as Bill mentioned, the answer is it wasn't studied because the last time point in the study was the, was just a one month later safety study. So a safety, uh, safety visit. So we don't have long-term data for what happens when we stop um, treatment. So everything else is just my hypothesis, which I'm happy to share, um, which is that I think that it would start to slowly grow back um, after stopping treatment. And this this hypothesis comes from data from selumetinib and treatment of plexiform neurofibromas. When you stop treatment of a plexiform neurofibroma with selumetinib, it can slowly start to grow back. Also, because when you stop, if you know, cell, um, this drug is putting the brakes on the pathway, um, that causes growth. And if you take away the breaks again, because you stopped the drug, so now the pathway is active again, I could imagine that it would um, lead to some tumor regrowth again. Um, the question is many questions, like how long would that take? Um, how long can you stop the drug for? Um, what's the rate of regrowth? Those are all you know, unknown questions, but my hypothesis is that if you were to stop the drug, that at some period of time, that tumor, if it's not fully senescent, will start to grow again. Another question was, uh, does this gel only prevent future fibromas or will it reduce the size of the current uh, cutaneous neurofibromas? 
Yeah, so the only data we have right now is that it reduces the size of recurrent cutaneous neurofibromas. And that is from this trial. I'm showing it right here. We have, you know, half, over half or five out of 10 of the cutaneous neurofibromas shrinking at least 50% in volume. 44% right of participants had that. So these are pre-existing cutaneous neurofibromas that are shrinking in volume after treatment with the drug. Um, prevention is another question. And the answer is, we don't know. Um, again, I can hypothesize that it's never been tested, so we can't give you any you know, concrete information on that. But possibly, if you were to block the pathway that drives them to form, that you could prevent them. But um, that's not what NFX is, uh, 179 is being um, tested for. Right. right. And uh, I, I can answer one of these questions. So people are, a lot of people are asking about, well, how can I uh, when, are we going to do a phase three trial? When it, when would you hope to start it? And can I get involved in that? And and we'd love to see that that enthusiasm and and the people uh, interested in participating. So our plan would be, if everything goes to plan, uh, would be to be able to start this study, a phase three trial in the second half of 2024. So this year. Um, and my suggestion would be to just keep an eye on the inflection website uh, and clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, the inflection website is uh, www.nflection.com. And you'll see announcements around that once we uh, start the process of beginning the study, uh, bringing on additional uh, research sites, et cetera. And so uh, if you were a participant in the phase two, and I know a lot of people are here because they've been telling me about their experience on that, they that was the best way to find out about the study. Also, the Children's Tumor Foundation has been a great partner. And so if you're not already signed up for the patient registry, that is another place that we emailed uh, frequently to recruit additional patients. So I would encourage everyone to sign up uh, for the Children's Tumor Foundation patient registry. Uh, that way you'll be kept up to date on when we plan to start this study as well. Uh, so let me see if there's so many questions. <laughs> let me see if there's some other uh uh, somebody asked what it was the minimum age of participants on this study. That's a, a real straightforward question. It was 18 years old. Um, we uh, do have, uh, some people have asked, is this an orphan drug? Yes, it is. We have orphan designation both in the United States and Europe. Um, and are there any long-term effects on liver function or other internal organs? As uh, uh, I'll let Kavita, that's a, probably a better question for you to answer. Yeah, I mean, during the course of the six month study, um, there were no significant systemic yeah. adverse effects that were drug related on the liver or any other internal organ. Yep. And, uh, you know, somebody asked a question about would, uh, or a couple of people asked about whether this would be covered by insurance. It's, uh, it's really too early to tell. That's a conversation that once we get approval uh, from the Food and Drug Administration, uh, that we would uh, then go to them and uh, to the various uh, insurance companies around the United States and propose that they cover it and give them the the uh, supporting data and rationale for them to do that. So that's we're probably a little too soon to be answering those types of questions as well yet. But uh, uh, you know, obviously, that's something that we would all want. Um, and let's see. I think we've covered most of them. There was a question that I saw that came through the chat instead of the Q&A that was asking about the discoloration and whether there was any effect as far as that went. Oh, on the one patient? Yeah, I'll let Kavita talk about that. Yeah, so um, I think you might be referring to this discoloration here, um, yeah. which was seen at baseline, and this is a cafe au lait macule. Um, cafe au lait macules are actually driven by RAS activation in the pigment cells, um, which leads to the growth of these um, pigmented patches on the skin. And that we don't, the answer is it's not been tested in NFX 179. So I cannot tell you whether or not it, it suppresses, um, uh, it's, it's, it blocks or inhibits or treats um, cafe au lait macules. In this one photograph, it does appear that this one cafe au lait macule lightens significantly during the course of treatment. There is also some recently published data that shows that uh, lightening of cafe au lait macules after treatment with systemic MEK inhibitors. So again, theory, like hypothesizing it's possible that treatment um, with NFX 179, a topical MEK inhibitor, could treat the pigmentation changes in um, the pigmentary lesions or cafe au lait macules, but that is that was not tested as an outcome in the study. All right. 
Uh, Gerd, do you see any that we haven't covered any of the primary themes here? Not really. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just again, had, yeah go ahead. Kavita. I, well, I just want to echo, I think, I thank you again, because I know many people on this are probably were participants in the, either the phase 2A or phase 2B or are thinking about being participants in phase 3. And uh, I know as, you know, as, as a physician who does clinical trials, I know it's, it's not easy to be a participant. You might spend six months of your time applying a moisturizer to your skin um, and not even have drug. And I, I know that like a lot of people are doing this to help the next generation, to help create, you know, to build something better, right? Um, not for themselves. And so I just wanted to thank everyone again, who's participated in the last two studies um, and who's, um, you know, willing to give of their time and, um, and efforts um, to, to help develop treatments for NF1. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, really appreciate the intense interest. Um, and, you know, please uh, keep an eye on clinicaltrials.gov or Inflection. We will obviously try to keep updating the community uh, as to our uh, progress on moving this forward. And, and we look forward to hopefully uh, someday in the not so distant future, having this widely available for people to use. And uh, again, really appreciate everybody coming out tonight as well. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.